Welcome to Random Reactions, a show where I discuss articles I've read over the past week and give my reactions to them on this episode. I laugh at a Star Wars full house mashup. I contemplate life with robots and the carbon footprint of the upcoming World Cup. I also enjoy a baseball story not related to the lockout. And I try a stout that means so much more than just being a winter warmer. Let's get random. Starting things off in my rundown this week, I start with the lighter side of stories. Star Wars fans probably know about the Disney Plus show The Book of Boba Fett, a Jon Favreau story in the Star Wars universe that has bounty hunter Boba Fett and mercenary and assassin Fennec Shand try to take over territory once owned by Jabba the Hutt. Many people also probably know about Full House, a show from the 1990s starring the late Bob Saget, may he rest in peace, and that future college scammer, I forget her name, what they do have in common, well, absolutely nothing until now. On a post on LaughingSquid.com, I came across a story from February 21st about the book of Boba Fett being reimagined as a 90s sitcom written by Laurie Dern. On, uh, on this article, there was a YouTube video from the Nerdist with the Book of Boba Fett being mashed up with Full House, now called Fett House, of course. While the video was posted on February 14th, the story was from February 21st, so it makes the cut on this show. The video is the reimagined opening credits of this bizarro world show, and I was falling out of my seat in the first 10 seconds. It was hilarious. This video has everything from the cheesy 90s sitcom music it's got playing to the full house fonts as actors and actresses are introduced as their characters. And the editing of the parts makes the show really seem like a goofy family comedy. And really, when you think about it, introducing the former star of Strangers with Candy, Amy Sedaris, and the former star of Santa Clarita Diet, Cobb Van, who are actually in the Book of Boba Fett, it kind of drives the point here. You get the characters' smiles as they eat and do other things. You get Baby Yoda. You get people screaming at monsters. It also reminded me of the 90s version of Land of the Lost. It really asks the question, do you feel lucky today? Well, I can tell you who doesn't feel lucky, the aspiring fry cooks at White Castle. Which brings me to the next story I found from this past week. It is called White Castle's Hiring 100 Robots at 100 Locations, also posted on February 21st in the Life and Culture section on the Patriot News' website, penlive.com, written by Darren Dalton. In the story, we learn of a strange new venture at the White Castle chains in Pennsylvania. Originally posted on Today.com, this story talks about how while many restaurants have been struggling to retain or find workers during the pandemic, White Castle is putting machines behind the counter. A Miso Robotics creation known as Flippy 2, uh, and this was actually tried at a Chicago-area White Castle back in September 2020, Flippy 2 is an upgrade. Miso Robotics explains that it is to improve efficiency at fast food restaurants, and it alleviates the duties of those pesky human workers, of course. They didn't say that in so many words, but it's the gist that I got out of it. Not only does Flippy 2 flip burgers, it also makes fries to order. Upon reading this story, I, I right away thought about the Fallout Universe robots, but in reality, Flippy is just an automated machine that's connected to the fryers and the grill with computerized programmed arms that makes orders after it's punched in. The upgraded version is really just a smaller version than the previous one that they released in Chicago. It takes up a little less space. But here's the real kicker on why this seems like a weird way to take away jobs from humans. According to Miso Robotics, Flippy can cost around $3,000 a month with the maintenance and cleaning costs. Pennsylvania workers right now just got an upgrade to a $15 an hour minimum wage, although I'm not sure that's past government jobs, but it's something that I saw. It equates to $2,400 a month if you're making $15 an hour per worker. Uh, and that's if they work full-time. But don't get confused, Flippy 2 is doing the work of several workers. And when you think of the efficiency they're going for to make more food and do it super quick, and the fact that the low-paying job is not really going to be one coveted by people in the future, it makes me question, why wouldn't they just automate the entire place if they deem it success and the profits rise? And that's not going to be good for humans, right? 
Now, don't think I hate advancement. I love technology. Technology is great. Uh, it makes many of our lives better. I'm recording this on technology. It could literally cure you of ailments and can help people do things that seem otherworldly. Bring me a mining robot so people don't have to get dust in their lungs or a robot in a factory so people aren't slowly killed by chemicals. And I'll say that's very good. Robots could also help with health and medicine. All very good things. But I just don't see the point in a burger flipping fry cooking robot. It seems like a waste of time. I personally started my work experience washing dishes at a restaurant, later doing everything from making appetizers and sauces to serving and doing inventory, essentially a manager. I sold hot chocolate at Soldier Field, ruining my pants and making more tips by getting the beer guy to come over. I worked at a crappy college dining hall that put me on the register with no training. I had to learn on the fly. But one question that I asked about which button I should press on a specific purchase, and I was told if you can't handle it, we'll put you back on the fryers. It was a little demeaning. It was very terrible. It really was. But guess what? I learned about management, how they treated workers. I learned what to do, what not to do, and how to do things better. I gained a lot of experience and a lot of responsibility that I was able to use later in my career, including today. Do I think food service workers should be paid more? Absolutely. Do I think the American tipping system is a scam by businesses to not actually pay their employees? It very well could be. Do I think that these jobs shouldn't exist at all? No. There are reforms and there are extremes. And Flippy 2 just seems like a big mistake to me. Another mistake is letting Qatar host the 2022 World Cup with its dry desert-like climate in the fall. Temperatures routinely hit 104 degrees Fahrenheit or 40 degrees Celsius at that time of year. And so I came across an article from a very busy February 21st, another one from there. It seemed to be full of stories this week. This article was called Qatar's World Cup Turf Needs Chilled Stadium's Desalinated Water to Thrive, and it was on Reuters.com, written by Andrew Mills. He writes about the conditions in the country, and to ensure the soccer pitch, uh, that it thrives in those conditions, the stadiums have to mimic winter. While it is impressive that experts have come up with a way to maintain 144 green fields, 8 stadium pitches, and 136 training grounds in a desert, uh, as Mills wrote, they they do it by blasting chilled air directly on the turf. It's, it's pretty impressive that we came up with that system as humans. Uh, but guess what? It doesn't stop there. Every year, Qatar flies in 140 tons of grass seed from the U.S. and needs to water the fields with desalinated water from the ocean. To refresh one's mind about how one desalinates water uh, from the ocean, it's a process that's extremely energy intensive. Uh, you have to remove the mineral, mineral components from the water, and there are two main ways. Distillation with the use of thermal energy and reverse osmosis with the use of mechanical energy. Qatar uses a thermal method and a lot of natural gas to desalinate its water supply. And because it has so much natural gas, it has one of the highest carbon footprints in the world. 50% of the water supply there is created through this process because, again, it's a desert. They don't have a lot of clean water that's ready to go the problem i have with this story is that they are watering these soccer pitches with 10,000 liters of desalinated water daily in the winter months and they use 50,000 liters a day in the summer months and just to put that in perspective on how absolutely insane that is that is the equivalent of using seven olympic sized pools worth of water per year and that's just to water grass so that they can host soccer games not to feed hungry people of course, not all hosts are bad. Just look at the MLB's Field of Dreams game last season with the heroics of Tim Anderson slaying the Yankees in a cornfield at the Field of Dreams movie site, uh, the stadium that they built there. That was a lot of fun, and I kind of feel like this year's scheduled game between the Cubs and Reds won't even come close to how great that inaugural game was. Not sure why the Cubs and Reds are even involved, but in an article on New Jersey Advance, uh, on the New Jersey Advance Media's website, nj.com, Red and Cuddy writes in another article published on February 21st that the MLB eyes historic Negro League Stadium for the Field of Dreams game. The article has a very good lead about the son of Larry Doby, who was the first black player in the American League in 1947. The son heard about stories not from the MLB, though, from his dad. He heard stories about Hincliffe Stadium in Patterson, New Jersey. 
Dobie told many stories about his tryouts and how the stadium once hosted many football battles between Eastside and Central High Schools. Dobie spoke of the stadium as if it was a mythical, magical place, Dobie Jr. told Gutty. At the moment, uh, a $94 million restoration project is underway to uh, revive the dormant stadium, essentially. And the mayor of Patterson hopes that the MLB will one day play a Field of Dreams game there. And the MLB does seem to be interested, according to an anonymous source in this article. Hinkcliffe and Rickwood Field in Alabama are both being talked about, allegedly. But when talking about Hinkcliffe uh, by itself, some great players played there in its history, including Cool Papa Bell. And it only cost Negro League teams 100 bucks a day to rent compared to Yankee Stadium at the time, which was $2,500. And while the Field of Dreams game was awesome, a game at this stadium with an actual baseball history, not from a movie, does sound really awesome. There's a planned Negro Leagues museum to be created at this finished, renovated site, and the venue is expected to hold over 7,000 fans. But whether Hincliffe or another historic stadium with Negro League ties gets used by the MLB for a game in the future, I would not only watch, I would be extremely excited to see the legends of the past honored, uh, which seems like a no-brainer for the MLB, as it has recently begun to include Negro League statistics as official MLB stats. And the story is a great one, with February being Black History Month, and that actually brings me to my top story of the week, written by Alex Detterer on KIMT.com, a story titled Forager Brewery set to release their Black is Beautiful Stout Friday to benefit Rochester NAACP. This was posted on February 15th, but the release was on February 18th, so it makes my cut for being in the past week. Yeah, I know I'm stretching it, but I thought it was a cool story. For those that don't know, the Black is Beautiful campaign was started in 2020 as a collaborative effort by the brewing community and its customers to bring awareness of the injustices people of color face daily, also looking to raise funds for police brutality reform and legal defenses for those who were wrong. The effort asks for breweries to brew this Black is Beautiful beer, which is a stout designed to showcase the many shades of black. Breweries can add their own twists on the base recipe, which is available for download on the blackisbeautiful.beer website. The ask is that breweries donate 100% of the beer's proceeds to local foundations that support equality and inclusion and to commit to the long-term work of equality and with the mission of the movement. Weathered Souls Brewing Company in San Antonio, Texas, which was founded by brewmaster Marcus Baskerville, gives part of their proceeds to the Know Your Rights campaign. There are 1,221 breweries across all 50 states and in 22 different countries that have participated in this collaboration to date, and Minnesota has over 40 breweries that have participated. Forager in Rochester, Minnesota is one of them, and in the article, brewmaster Jacob Ryan tapped the kegs on February 18th in order to raise money to the Rochester chapter of the NAACP. Uh, these are, of course, limited edition brews, and they might already be gone in Rochester, but there are other places that might have them. While I was not able to obtain the version from Forager, I did find one in Minneapolis from Fair State Brewing Cooperative. The one I found is a barrel-aged version of Fair State's 2021 Black is Beautiful Imperial Stout, blended in collaboration with Conso Brewing in Atlanta. It was originally made to be at the Brews for New Avenues event in Portland, this version uses figs, vanilla beans, and holiday spice in the finished barrels, and all the proceeds go to Appetite for Change, a mission in North Minneapolis that uses food as a tool by having people learn, cook, eat, and grow food to create lasting social change. And I bought two bottles, because why not? And now I will tell you just how good a beer tastes when it's combined with a cause. So this is the Black is Beautiful a Barrel Aged Beer from Fair State Brewing Cooperative in Northeast Minneapolis, and I'm very excited to try this beer, not just for the flavor. Uh, this is a barrel aged beer with vanilla and figs and, and other spices, but I'm also excited uh, just for the fact that I'm helping to support a cause. Uh, so bottoms up, let's see what this guy tastes like. Wow, that is 
definitely the Imperial. You know it's a little higher in alcohol. But the sweetness of it really takes away that alcohol taste. Like it you know it's strong, but it doesn't you don't get those fusel alcohol flavors. And uh it's a very beautiful beer. Uh this is very good. And I'm a huge stout and porter fan. So I knew that this beer was going to be up my alley to begin with. Uh, and again, even if this beer tasted terrible, I'd be fine with it because I'm supporting a cause. But it, it tastes great. And that's the cool thing about breweries. Taking this basic recipe, putting their own twists on it. I, I, it, really does, it really does add a little bit to have that cause behind it as well. Uh, you know, and again, I don't necessarily want to grade the beer uh, based on that, but if I really was, if, if this wasn't for a cause and I was just grading the beer itself uh, in terms of stouts, I would definitely give this very close to five stars because it has uh, both the, the bite that you would get in an imperial stout, it has that little bit of sweetness, it has that chocolate flavor, which actually balances the sweetness very well. Uh, I really like the fig and vanilla notes in there. The spice notes are a little hidden. Um, you know, I'm kind of a person that likes bold flavor, so I wouldn't mind the, the spice flavor being higher, but uh, just grading this beer, like I said, it's close to a five. It's a very good beer. Um, it's, a, it's a high alcohol beer, so it's not one that you're going to have like a lot of, but uh, again, for a cause, you can't go wrong. It's a great beer. Uh, I'm very glad that I'm able to help support the Black is Beautiful campaign. Uh, and cheers to everybody. Thanks for watching, liking, and subscribing. And remember, random is good. And in this case, it's very good. Seems to find the time to discover visions lost in their minds. Searching and scrolling, avoiding the trolls and wishing for the seconds to start slowing. Reading the news while I drink delicious booze. Pick and choose whether to debate this or discover a new food. Rap battles and video games, no reason to wait. My passions lead to tasks and distraction A weekly live action attraction Utter satisfaction As you watch my random reactions This is a Sun Dried Tomatoes channel production by Anthony Ozzo. Follow, like, and subscribe and check out other shows and a video version of the monthly podcast that you can also get audio-only versions most places that podcasts are found.